thank you all for joining me and uh, for having me here to speak about issues that are very important uh, in my life. Um, I want to talk to you about property theory. And I want to also make a point about why theory matters, but I don't think I have to make that point very strongly with this audience because at the heart of it, what property theory means is it's how we imagine land, how we think about it as an abstract concept. So to do that, I'm going to begin with a place. And I'm going to begin with a place for two reasons. One, because to begin with a place, will help me to explain to you the importance of property theory and how it actually matters in an on-the-ground, everyday kind of way. And also because that place will tell you something about how I got to where I am uh, in my work and the perspective that I have. Um, it will tell you why I want to be the voice that I am in this fight. Uh, and it will tell you something about a place that's very personal to me. So, Appalachia, when I say that word, and I say Appalachia, not Appalachia, if you're from there, it's Appalachia, and that's where I'm from, born and raised. My family has been there for many generations on both sides, and uh, typical of families there, there's a mixture of European ancestry and Native American ancestry, and uh, this is a place that is very important to me. It's also a place where I think uh, growing up can be an interesting challenge. So growing up there, I grew up in a farming family. So my family was very attached to the land where we were, and I was taught uh, to value that land. At the same time, I was in a county that was absolutely surrounded by strip mining. Right? This is where I grew up as a child, was playing outdoors, and um, it's really quite a wonder that I survived my childhood. Uh, mostly because my parents had absolutely no clue of how much trouble we got up to. Uh, we had these big farms, lots of acreage, and they knew we roamed the farms. What our parents didn't realize is that my cousins and I actually also roamed onto the strip mines. Because we didn't really understand the dangers of doing that. We didn't understand, being small children, that doing things like crawling back in exploratory mining tunnels was extremely dangerous uh, because those tunnels collapsed regularly. Uh, it also didn't occur to us that petting the bats inside there wasn't a fantastic idea. Right? So we did that sort of thing too. So I grew up with this family that is honoring and valuing and working on the land all the time. But also, as I'm wandering out as a child from our own property onto the mines, what I'm seeing, and as the streams come onto our property as well, I'm seeing that the water is orange. It's not clear, it's orange. And it's orange because it has sulfuric acid in it. Right? And this is a part of, when I'm very, very small, uh, this is part of how I'm learning about what the world is, right? How I am learning about a set of values. But the problem is, for my childhood, it's two conflicting sets of values at all times. And that makes it a little hard for a kid to kind of figure out which way is right and which way is wrong, right? So then, fast forward to another formative instance. When I was 11 years old, my grandfather passed away on Christmas Eve and he died of beryllium poisoning. Beryllium poisoning uh, comes from uh, exposure uh, to chemicals that are used in the process of nuclear work. And that was how my grandfather was exposed. He was exposed at Oak Ridge, Tennessee, which was where he was working at the time. Right? And a significant enough exposure damages your lungs, you can't breathe well, and you die as a result. A little similar to lung cancer, but not exactly. Right? So, this is the place where I grew up. And I want to show you some images of this place. Let's start with this one. I want you to think for a moment about when you think this photo might be taken. I think it's possible you could look at this photo and think that 1870 is a fair guess. Right? Workable. It could be 1870. It could be 1910. This is my uncle, and it's 1970. It's 1970. Just a few years before I was born, 1977. Right? In Appalachia, 
the images from the time can often look like images from 100 years before. These are not my distant ancestors. These are my immediate family. These are my grandparents, Albert and May, who farmed their entire lives and both died in their 90s. This is my grandfather doing what uh, is now called sustainable logging, which means that you don't create roads into the forest. Instead, you use horses to go into the forest and remove one tree at a time and to bring it out individually on something that looks like this. So you don't need a road, you don't need to do all of that destruction, and you can actually remove timber as it's needed on a small scale without being so destructive. This is more of my family, my cousins. And this is my grandmother with my mother and her brothers and sisters. And I want you now, taking those photographs in mind, to think a little bit about the landscapes of Appalachia. What do you think of when you think of the landscapes that you would expect to see in Appalachia? Or more particularly, I like to ask you, what do books and movies tell you that you should think is in Appalachia? Okay. What do you expect to see? These are some images of where I grew up. It's an astonishingly beautiful place. Mountains, extraordinary sunrises and sunsets, lovely small fields, high alpine bogs, a landscape that is unique within all of North America. Within the United States, this is the only part uh, of the bogs that carries down from Canada and creates a unique landscape within the US. These places, these images, I think are not what you always expect, right? That isn't probably what you had in mind when I said think about what books and movies want uh, you to think about Appalachia. So why does that matter? Because environmental law constantly faces something that I like to call the ugly bug problem. And what that is, is it's really easy to raise awareness and create enthusiasm to get people to invest money and social capital for polar bears and dolphins and penguins, right? They're cute. They're cute. You can't really object to that, right? They're very, very cute. It's so easy to get people involved in those things. It's much harder to convince people that they should save ugly bugs, right? That they should care about what is less beautiful in the world. And we know this because when uh, in nonprofits, I sit on the board of one uh, in, in the region, when nonprofits sit out to raise money, there's a distinct difference in how much money we can pull in, depending on how we depict the campaign and how we speak about the resources that we're saving. We have to avoid the ugly bug problem if we want to be successful. Right? Uh, interestingly, uh, the American Bar Foundation is currently doing uh, work on the emotion of disgust. And the Bar Foundation's research, uh, they employ not only lawyers, but also psychologists uh, and uh, social scientists. And what they're finding is that the reaction of disgust is really quite useful politically. Why? Because people are not split on disgust across the Democrat to Republican spectrum. They're not. We all think things that are disgusting are disgusting. We don't disagree about that. And so, if you present an environmental problem, and they've now been designing these studies and asking people about when would you contribute money, when would you change your vote, those sorts of things, if we portray the problem as uh, you know, the rise of sea levels, you have a really hard time getting conservatives interested. On the other hand, if you portray to conservatives an image of a sink that's pouring out brown water, they're all on board. Disgust is the universal emotion. The problem then is that disgust only works really well for some things, right? 
So we can portray disgust relatively easily uh, if we want to think about something like water quality. It's easy to get those images of those orange streams in Appalachia. Where are those going? Directly into the well water that people are drinking there. Hence, enormous cancer rates, right? Uh, it's easy to get those disgust images. Climate change, it's really a struggle to get disgust images for climate change, right? Because our real problem is sea level rise, temperature change, shifts in air currents, loss of edges of land masses, uh, destabilization of small scale economies and vulnerable populations. Disgust really doesn't work very well as a metaphor for us there, as a platform for emotional engagement. The lesson then again is that how we imagine property matters. So I wanna move from this then to thinking about how is it that we theorize property? How do scholars, uh, how do lawyers and politicians, uh, how does our legislature think about the idea of property theory? It sounds very abstract, but I promise it's not nearly as amorphous as it sounds. The basic idea is that there are certain perceptions of land that then tell us uh, how we wanna make law, right? How do we imagine the concept of property and what it means to us. So a basic way of thinking about this is that uh, property is in large part about possession and exclusion. Those are the key notions that have traditionally uh, been behind our idea of property theory, the relationship between those two things. In other words, they work together to inform our idea of what property law is, what property itself is. So about possession and exclusion, these have always mattered. Uh, and uh, they should matter to a certain degree because uh, exclusion and possession can be about your family's very survival, right? Your access to the resources that feed and provide for your family, that allow your family to thrive. And these can be deeply emotional issues as well. Think about that property is one of the ways that mental illness often expresses itself. Think about uh, for patients who have dementia and Alzheimer's, the most commonly reported delusion is the delusion of an intruder. Someone who is coming into your own space, even if that person is non-threatening, Right? They're not there to assault you, they're not there to hurt you. The delusion is not about being harmed. The delusion is about the loss of your right to exclude, the loss of control, right? the sense of control that private property gives you, that ability to exclude someone else. TV means that we all know about hoarders. Right? Hoarders are uh, expressing their mental illness through property through the constant consumption and accumulation, right? This is a, like a tick, it is something that is allowing those people to create a sense of stability. Uh, you may not know about, there's also an opposite mental condition, which is the compulsive divesting yourself of things. And those unfortunate people will buy five toasters a year. And they do that because they buy a toaster, they make themselves toast for a couple of days, they get tired of toast, as we all do, after you eat the same thing three or four days in a row. They can't keep the toaster and not use it. They can't just put it in the cabinet. And so they give it away to Goodwill, and then fast forward a month later and they decide they want some more toast, they buy another toaster, right? So five, six toasters a year because they can't keep the toaster, right? They impulsively have to get rid of things. If you think about the people you know in your life, you are very likely to be able to think about milder forms of these because the milder forms of these are actually quite common, that people either compulsively gather or they compulsively divest, right? The point then being property is a very emotional thing. It's also a very human thing. We don't have a real way around it. So this idea of possession and exclusion the ability to lock other people out right, uh, is key to what we think uh, that property should be. It's about fencing people out. It's about the possibility of telling someone else uh, that they have no business on your land or telling you what you should or shouldn't do with your land. Think about uh, why is this idea of a man's home as his castle such a popular cultural theme? 
It's in tons of movies and books, uh, not only in America, but also in England, in Australia, in Canada. It's a popular theme. And there's a reason for that. There's something that we are latching onto there. Somehow we feel the need, even in landscapes that are very, very open, to still have that fence. When it's miles and miles between, and as I, this is a picture that I took, uh, all of these are ones that I took except the family ones at the beginning. Um, I drove through uh, this section uh, probably four hours and didn't meet another car but they still need a fence, right? I'm not 100% sure what the fence is doing, but there's clearly some emotional need still there to mark the fence, right? Uh, so that you can say that it's yours, right? Uh, we seem to have that compulsion to tell people to keep out, right? Uh, to be able to say then that uh, something is ours, which means not yours, right? Not someone else's. So. With that in mind, what does property mean? What does it mean for a piece of land? And I think of the old stone fences, right? Our old, some of our oldest ideas of marking off land as ours when I think about what does property mean. So let's think about how this has been operationalized uh, in terms of legal rights. Our most traditional view our most traditional view uh, looks like this. The individual has rights to the thing, right? Land is an object, we act on the object, and this is what the relationship looks like. Uh, it's a model of near complete control. It's a model that emphasizes and is often described in the law as dominion and control is the definition of possession and therefore also the definition of property. Um, so this is the oldest common law uh, model of rights to land. Uh, this is the model that existed in England back into medieval days uh, and it's the model that was carried over to the US uh, with colonization. Now an interesting thing about this model is that there have been a few scholars who have tried to kind of go back and find a theme of conservation within this model. Going back to old England and to say, ah, well, you know, maybe they did actually do it better then. And so, uh, for example, uh, Jed Purdy's book, The Meaning of Property. In this book, he uh, discussed waste law and essentially made the argument that the purpose of waste law, which is law that you can use to claim uh, a, a diminishment in value of property, uh, was used as a conservation mechanism. Unfortunately, Jed's wrong about that. And that paper that uh, Leslie mentioned that won the uh, AALS, the National Scholarly Prize, was actually a paper that I used to prove that Jed was wrong uh, about that uh, by historical research. Uh, what waste law actually did when it preserved land uses there was to preserve boundary rights. It was a substitute for not being able to survey very well. That's what it actually did. Uh, so it wasn't about conservation at all. Other people have tried to do the same thing with something that if you've read anything about medieval history, you've heard of this idea of forest law. And other people have tried to do that with forest law, but unfortunately there's no truth to that story either. Uh, forest law was not common law, and so in fact it wasn't common to the entire landscape. It was actually just a tiny portion of property. Uh, and it also uh, was land that was not being set aside for conservation, but being set aside for specific uses. In other words, ship mass, right? When you need individual, large, strong trees, uh, what does the Royal Navy of England need? They need ship mass. And that's why you set aside a royal forest. <laughs> why else do you need them? Well, you may have heard all this talk recently about how you can't rebuild the Notre Dame Cathedral, right? You can't rebuild it the way it was. Why? Because we don't have the trees. We don't have them uh, on the scale uh, that, they, that they were at that time. That's what the forest law was doing. It was, to a certain degree, conserving, but it was conserving only for a very specific purpose and with no sense of an ecosystem or the well-being of that ecosystem in the long term, but more that the, the, the royal government didn't want to run out of things that it desperately needed, i.e., ships to protect the country and building materials for nice big cathedrals that celebrate things like coronations. Right? 
So this common law model is a model of individual control, individual rights, emphasis on exclusion, and mine, 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 right? Um, it was a model that at least tolerated exploitation and at worst invited exploitation. So going back to the past uh, isn't a good plan, right? Uh, we can't really take the past and truthfully celebrate it as a way to go, right? So in light of that, That being our sort of foundational legal theory in America about property, starting in the 1990s, there's, there was a movement of scholars called progressive property scholars. Progressive property scholars uh, was essentially a group of very liberal uh, lawyers and, uh, and academics who wanted to say that this individualized, hyper-private uh, rights model was a really bad plan. And it was a really bad plan because if we conceptualize rights this way, then uh, I didn't have any right to say, you over there should not use your land in a way that pollutes the air for all of us, right? Because if I did so, then I would be interfering with your individualized rights. So progressive property scholars started creating a model that looks like this. It's often described as a community model or a social rights model. It means that Everything is imagined in the context of competing interests between the individual owner and society itself, which is then allowed to push back and regulate because it is society who is agreeing to and respecting your individual rights. Society essentially gets something for that in exchange, and that something for that is the right to regulate, right? The right to say uh, that there are externalities from your land uses that are important. A good part of this was influenced by economics and by the rise of a movement called law and economics. And so what it really meant was that uh, they focused on this word externalities as an idea that you could use your individual piece of land and it might be uh, really economically be beneficial for you to operate, say, a concentrated animal feeding operation something we call CAFOs in environmental law. That could be economically great for you, but really problematic for other people in the area. Those problems for other people are called externalities because they're not really visited on the individual landowner themselves, right? So that fueled this idea of progressive property theory as a community-based model. And this is what is still really seen as the cutting edge of property theory, uh, although it's been the cutting edge since the 1990s. Uh, and so the problem, what I, uh, what I am writing about at the moment, is that progressive thinking on property theory is not working. It's not taking us to where we actually want to go. And it's not a winning bet when it comes to the enforcement of laws in a way that actually creates a sustainable future. So to explain that to you a little bit better, I want to go to the common law and the very idea of environmental protection. And specifically, this idea of nuisance. So when I say common law, I mean the law that we inherited from England, not new interesting statutes that we have made things since then, like the Clean Water Act, but the old stuff that we inherited, right? Nuisance is a cause of action that we inherited originally. And nuisance is the idea uh, that we can sue a neighboring landowner when they do something bad when they do something that's problematic to us, when they cause noise and dust and vibrations and all those sorts of things that make our own property miserable, right? Because of how they have used theirs. So nuisance law has existed since medieval times and it has an interesting history in terms of environmental, um, environmental law itself. This is a timeline of sorts, a rough timeline. So starting on the left, this idea of controlling problematic neighbors, right? Uh, this is where the idea of nuisance began. There was something called Aldred's case, which is one of the earliest ones. Aldred's case comes from 1610, and Aldred's case is about a pig farm. 
So this guy moves into a neighborhood and he establishes a pig farm. You know what happens when someone establishes a pig farm in your neighborhood? It is very smelly. It ruins your water quality. It is really rather uncomfortable for everyone else around. Although interestingly, it seems that the person on the property themselves becomes somewhat eventually oblivious to the smells, right? They sort of get a, get a long-term uh, uh, ability to just not even notice that it's there. But all of their neighbors, not so much, right? So the whole idea was how do you control the bad behavior of an individual neighbor who's causing disruption in the, in, in the entire area? And that was what nuisance did for a very long time, essentially all the way through until about the 1960s. And in the 1960s, you get the rise of statutory schemes. This is the great environmental movement, the creation of the Clean Water Act, the Clean Air Act, uh, NEPA, all of these various acronyms that we now have uh, that tell us that Regulation is going to push back against individual landowners and control things like water and air quality. With the rise of statutory schemes, a lot of people saw nuisance law as no longer important anymore because regulation was going to take care of most of that for you and provided that regulation actually happened, it, uh, it just wasn't necessary to think about nuisance. And so in a world of more regulations, uh, nuisance law is no longer important for environmental law, no longer important for communities, right? Progressive property theory, interestingly, justifies this center block in this timeline, right? Because progressive property theory is about bolstering the idea that regulation is a good thing that should be tolerated in society and that it should trump your highly individualistic view of private property, right? The problem is we need to not live in that era anymore. We need to move to the era of climate change. We need to move to the far side of this timeline, and we are. And nuisance claims are now doing something for us uh, that, uh, that did not exist uh, even 30, 40, 50 years ago. Uh, and so let me give you an example of what that is. There's something called anticipatory nuisance. What this means is I don't have to wait until my neighbor builds a pig farm. I can go to court and stop my neighbor from ever building the pig farm. Right? I actually can go ahead and not ask regulation to tamp down the pollution later on. I can actually go and stop it before it ever happens. Can anticipatory nuisance work? Yes, absolutely. It does. Only downsides, it's expensive litigation. It's expensive. And uh, so mostly nonprofits like the Environmental Law Foundation, uh, those types of organizations are pursuing these claims because you need that scale of resources to do it very well. It's harder for individual landowners to do it, but there seems to be a building movement of more and more individual landowners who are trying to make these claims work. And a resurgence of nuisance claims uh, that are directed at localized land harms. Right? So I want to talk to you about nuisance law a little bit in specific. So nuisance law uh, used to be a very powerful tool. And the problem uh, for using it now uh, in the climate change era is that there were two parts of uh, two movements uh, within law that are problematic. They have eroded what was originally available uh, in nuisance law. So nuisance law has been eroded in two ways. Reason number one, nuisance law has been eroded. It was originally thought of as a property claim. And that means that there was pretty much strict liability. What you had to prove was unreasonable interference with the use and enjoyment of land. Those are the words that were there in medieval times and they're still there in our state statutes today. Unreasonable interference with the use and enjoyment of land. That was considered a strict liability question and what you had to prove was the interference. In other words, my use and enjoyment have dropped because my water quality has dropped, because my air quality has dropped, because I can't stand the smell that's here now, right? All those sorts of things. Except now, 
there's a push around the country and a number of jurisdictions that, and when I say there's a push, I mean this has happened since the, about the 1950s coming forward uh, that this has occurred, uh, some of it a little more towards the 1970s, but nuisance law is being eroded by thinking of it more like a tort. So what is a tort? In law, a tort is about negligence. Right? It's about bad behavior. It means that we don't worry so much about accidents unless those accidents are uh, reckless to a certain degree on your part. Right? You were negligent or reckless in your behavior to others. In other words, we're no longer asking about the interference in terms of the impacts of the property. We're now categorizing interference as conduct. Right. So the question now is the bad behavior of the landowner, not the impacts on the next door land. That means it's no longer a strict liability claim, and that means that accidental nuisances, which used to be very highly actionable at the common law, it was easy to recover for an accidental nuisance, it's now really hard to do that. Uh, and so you now have to prove essentially that that conduct was in some way willfully done. Right, so that they knew what was going to happen and still chose to do it anyway. So not about conduct, uh, but about impacts. Originally, now, at least in some jurisdictions, I count about 17 of the 50 states. It's more about conduct and less about uh, the impacts, right? Here's the thing about that. It still fits with that community social rights interpretation of property theory, right? If we think in terms of community and social rights and it's all about the interplay between the landowner and the others, then looking to conduct makes sense, right? All of tort law is about the interplay between us and our neighbors, right? Uh, so it fits with that progressive idea of property theory. The second thing that's happened is that many jurisdictions have actually changed the original wording that you needed to prove, what you needed to prove to get money, to get damages, to get an injunction out of a nuisance claim. And so they've added social utility as a part of the analysis. So now, not only do you prove the uh, unreasonable interference with use and enjoyment of land, but the court now balances that against what's called the social utility of the defendant's actions. So what does that mean? That means how many jobs do they create? How many tax dollars do they bring in? Right? All those kinds of things. So in fact, now, when you go to argue your claim, you can't win in those jurisdictions. Again, at least so far, this is a minority. But it, I think it's a very problematic minority. In these jurisdictions, I can prove a significant interference with my land and still recover nothing because the court decides that the social utility of my neighbor's actions are too important. And so therefore, the drop in value of my land becomes unimportant to the court, right? So those are, again, uh, when you think about it, uh, sustainability can try to play into that metric. We can try to argue things like ecosystem services and the value that's given back to that to prove social utility, but the problem is it's already playing on that field and it's really hard to win. It's hard to get those numbers and line them up against jobs and tax dollars. And I say that especially as someone who comes from Appalachia because I can't sit there as someone who grew up on a family farm and look down on my neighbors who worked for coal companies. Because you know why they did? Because they wanted to feed their families, right? Were they aware of the level of environmental destruction they were causing? Absolutely. Did they like it? No. Did they think they had another choice? No, unfortunately, right? This wasn't something they wanted to do. So there's no reason for me to look down on them what they're doing because what I am doing in doing that is looking at another poor family and saying they're making worse choices than my family is making. And I don't think that's true. I think they made the choices that they had to make and took the opportunities that they had to. But the problem is then that if we try and look at things in this social utility uh, point of view, then although sustainability can introduce its own economic numbers, we're still likely to lose. We're likely to lose against jobs and taxes because those things are important, right? So again, uh, thinking of social utility in this way, how does that fit with progressive property theory? Progressive property theory supports this approach, right? Progressive property theory thinks about community interactions and the social relationships. So they can't really, they're not in a position to argue against considering jobs and taxes, 
right? Because that absolutely fits with that perception of what property rights are, that they are this social relationship between individuals and the rest of society. An additional thing that, uh, that complicates this uh, for social utility is how do we evaluate in terms of scale? Local, state, national, international. In other words, when you ask what are the social benefits, where are you looking? Because if you look at different levels, you'll get different answers to that question, unsurprisingly. And law, unfortunately, has a really bad habit of assuming that scale is a super easy question. Because we just say federal, state, and we're done. Right? Super easy question. The reality is that's not actually what it looks like. And I'll use Appalachia to give you another example of that. So if you think about farming communities and the jobs, the tax benefits that come out of farming communities, if we're thinking about communities on a very small scale, right, where we think about an individual farm and what they are thinking about, right, uh, then it's easy to imagine what the benefits are to operating the farm there, right? Uh, income for this family, they're able to uh, bring in enough money to feed their family, enough crops to feed their family, all those sorts of things. But if we move then to evaluating an individual farm on the scale of, say, a river system, this is the Ohio River. It sits between Ohio and Kentucky, and there is a fascinating little legal story about that. The Ohio River is one of the most uh, polluted uh, rivers in the country historically. And uh, in, uh, in earlier times, about 100 years ago, Kentucky and Ohio used to fight about who owned it, why? Because each one of them wanted to tax the barges and the river boats and gambling that took place on the river, all those sorts of things. So each one wanted to own it. Fast forward to the environmental revolution and they now say, oh no, it's yours. It's yours. <laughs> it's yours. It's definitely not mine. I don't want it. <laughs> I don't want it. So neither state admits to owning it now. Right? Why? Because it's so expensive to even consider cleaning up the Ohio River. Right? No one wants it. So how do we evaluate the scale? And I want to show you, this, by the way, is taken, that picture is taken maybe 30 miles from where my family lives. And uh, this is a barge on that river. Um, and uh, this is taken, I don't know, maybe a, a year ago. Uh, those barges push coal up and down this river. Why? Because this is a really easy way to get coal out of Appalachia, is to uh, take it on trucks uh, to either a train station or to the river and then put it on the barges, right? So I want to tell you a little scale story that goes along with this. Uh, so there's something called the Tennessee Valley Authority. It's a federal agency. Uh, Roosevelt created it. It still exists today. Its original mission was to create, to harness hydroelectric power, capitalizing on the fact that the military happened to sort of accidentally own some property uh, that would work very well for putting in hydroelectric dams. That property was transferred to the agency, and the agency was given congressional authorization to purchase more property, right? Uh, interestingly, if you go back and look at Roosevelt's discussion of the Tennessee Valley Authority, it is remarkable in terms of modern American politics because that agenda could be taken out and described as socialist in a heartbeat, right? It is very, very forward thinking. It was a manifesto of addressing poverty in the South. It was not only a one-off, but intended to be an experiment for national replication, Roosevelt said. We were to try this to alleviate poverty in Appalachia, and if it worked, we were going to repeat it across the country, right? So it was an experiment. Uh, and here's the problem, though. Right after the TVA invests in all this really pretty socialist rhetoric, you get the rise of communism and the fear of communism and socialism in the United States and the TVA is fighting for its life as an agency, right? It's being criticized. It's in the political cartoons, in the, in the New York Times and in the Washington Post. And what people are saying is this agency uh, isn't American, it isn't democratic. Well, what happens, unsurprisingly, is the agency fights back. What happens with organizations? Organizational continuity. No one wants to lose their job. It's really hard to kill a federal agency, 
right? They don't go away because everyone there is invested. So what happens? Uh, without any change from Congress in the mission of the TVA, the TVA moves to supporting the military machine that is gearing up for World War II. The TVA f moves from hydroelectric power to buying coal and running coal-fired power plants. The TVA soon produces uh, its power that was supposed to go to poor families and create rural electricity co-ops. Uh, more than 50% of it goes to the Oak Ridge facility alone to pursue nuclear experimentation there. Hydroelectric power isn't enough anymore. What was supposed to be a sustainable, environmentally friendly, and conservation friendly attitude switches to uh, what's in fact deeply destructive because once the TVA gets these coal fired power plants up and running, it becomes the largest producer, I'm sorry, the largest consumer of coal that is strip mined. Why? Because it's convenient. Where is coal? It's in Appalachia. Where's the Tennessee Valley Authority? In southern Appalachia. They're getting all of this coal. And so uh, essentially, World War II turned the TVA into uh, a war machine without any change from Congress. If you go look in the mission statement, it's still pretty much the same, still in today. But that's not at all what the TVA actually does, right? So how do you get that kind of mission drift? Scale, right? Because the TVA was supposed to create social benefits, that, and, and it talked about the national scale, right? Because this was an experiment that was supposed to be replicated. But the TVA turned into an enemy of the South. The TVA turned into, right, the TVA has now regularly been sued by North Carolina, Tennessee, uh, for the environmental impacts, right, of its work. And that's because the statute was ambiguous about where to evaluate this concept of social benefits. Were we looking at a local or a national scale? And that ambiguity meant that social utility could be defined in this hyper-flexible way. Right? So you can imagine how very malleable this concept is. Right? Um, and so if we think in terms of even World War II, we can think on the positive side of rationing and conservation, we can think about this. Bones wanted. Bones make glue for airplanes and other essential war equipment, right? This is a don't throw anything away kind of mentality, right? On the other hand, switch off the light, turn the gas down, don't waste water, release more coal for the war drive. This is the conflict between the two. Right? This is, on the one hand, reduce your consumption, but on the other hand, why are you reducing it? So it can go to the war machine. Right? If we then think of what's happening within that war machine, right? this is social utility. Right? More miners are wanted. The problem with defining things in terms of social utility, in terms of community values, is that you always have to answer the scale question. And social utility is so amorphous that the definition can change with the politics of any time. There's no guarantee that sustainability can ever win. And that means that all of the social effort, all the feeling and revolution that's put into a change of law can be done away with in one bad election, right? One small change. That's a huge risk. I call it the risk of empty wins, right? It's the risk of empty wins. We may be able to establish a new statute, but if nothing is happening in a way uh, that is enduring, we have expended a lot of value without getting lasting change. So let's go back then to those models. What should property mean? Not what does it mean, but what should it mean? So if we think about the original model uh, was one uh, that was about the individual to the land. Nuisance, and you think in the context of nuisance, what does it bring and why do I think that it's actually potentially important as a tool going forward? Because I have very limited faith in regulation. And the reason I have limited faith in regulation is because I have limited faith in enforcement. Um, I, I sort of wanna just explain that sentence by saying, see Trump's EPA, 
right? Uh, but I can also say, see uh, the fact that Governor Bevan of Kentucky uh, chooses to employ exactly one man who tests for water quality in 120 counties in a state that takes five hours to drive across, right? That man cannot enforce permits if he works 24 hours a day, right? Every day of the year, he can't, right? But if you don't have enforcement of those regulations, they end up being relatively meaningless, right? So that's what you get a lot in mining country in Kentucky is that there's non-compliance with the statutes. Um, it's a foundational problem though uh, in another way. And that is that what we're relying on when we think of regulations is things like federal agencies. And federal agencies can be great, and they have done some very useful things in many ways in the country, but they also have a problem in the environmental context that they don't have a real stake, right? Some people may care, but they don't have a real stake. The interesting thing about nuisance law is that the two parties on the side of the court case have an extraordinary stake in the outcome. If I sue the neighboring pig farm, the neighboring concentrated animal feeding operation, Right? That becomes very important. An example of that right now, I live in Virginia currently, uh, and that's in the Fourth Circuit's federal territory, and right now we have multiple decisions against Smithfield Farms. You know Smithfield, they produce hams and chickens and all of this processed packaged meats and things. We not only have nuisance judgments against them right now, we have massive punitive damages awards against them for bad behavior in the communities within the Fourth Circuit. They're gonna appeal those. They're probably gonna to try to appeal them up to the US Supreme Court. We're still waiting to see what happens with that. And we're also waiting to see what happens if they try filing bankruptcy as a way to potentially get out of them, right? Which is another possibility. But nuisance law is actually doing something in Virginia in terms of those concentrated animal feeding operations that all of our regulations on water quality cannot and does not do. Right? Uh, and so we are able to then actually take the citizens of Virginia who care and put them in as plaintiffs, right, into these organizations. By the way, the, um, the council uh, who, who uh, tried one of these cases uh, works for the uh, Humane Society of America, right? So again, if you can get some funding to back these, and for that, it was the Humane Society actually took on these cases, uh, not a specifically environmental group. So this model of property, I'm not a fan of this original individual land versus individual idea because what it is is a model of dominion and control. But the problem is I also don't like this progressive one because it's a model of balancing interests. It's a conflict-based model that always puts the individual private landowner against the rest of society, and it assumes that the best uh, world for others is not the best world for the owner, which is not necessarily true. It also then uh, creates this world where all regulation is seen as a pushback against that right to exclude, right? It's a loss of your individual rights, and it's easy to get people all worked up about that, right? They have lost their individual rights uh, when we think about regulation. Um, but there's something, I want you to look at this model now and compare it to the last one. So individual to land, the original medieval model, owner to others. There's something really odd about this model when you think about it, right? There's no land here. There's no actual, right? It's supposed to be a model of property, but there isn't actually property there, right? It may be, in fact, a useful model, I think, of property if we want to think about property in terms of genetics, intellectual property, privacy, those sorts of amorphous things. But when it comes to land, I think it's actually important that land be a part of our model of property and that we don't just imagine it as our idea, our vision for what property is that then funnels into all of our laws is just about social relationships because the reality is it no, it's not, it can't be. It's about the use of the land, right? That's what's at the bottom of this, right? Land is unique in terms of property. So what I argue for uh, is something that looks more like this. And I think the answer is actually very simple. I think that the answer is a model that's based on stewardship. 
And people talk about, well, is it possible to say, uh, have standing for trees? Right, that sort of things. Could we let the, the river itself have standing? That's a movement currently in England. Um, there's something interesting about that approach to things, uh, but I don't think it's actually necessary. Uh, and it's also logistically kind of hard to work into the common law because we, that's not how we imagine things as objects having individual standing. But if we instead think uh, of property ownership not as a model of social rights, the individual against society, but we instead think about this special status of landed property, and we think about it as a series of obligations. In other words, when you go to buy a property, you should do this the way that you think about getting married. It should be a serious commitment, one that you're a little bit afraid to make. You should reasonably be a little bit afraid to make and be asking yourself, can I take on this relationship? Can I financially afford to provide for this land in a way that's reasonable, right? I think there's a good reason to treat land as something different from other kinds of property. It's our most fundamental home, and I think worthy of unique status. It's the foundation of our survival and the very possibility of survival. So why not treat it as something slightly different? If we view property ownership as a responsibility, an obligation, not just a right, we don't have to try and create land as a plaintiff, stand in its stead uh, for it as a plaintiff, but instead we think about the obligations and rights that we should have as individuals as stewards of any property that we own. Right? This means then that the individual and society aren't competitors. Instead, uh, and they're not vying for the benefits of the land, instead we are all humans. And we are all humans who have to rely on it as our way of thinking about home. And one of the things that then happens if you switch to a model of stewardship is that it automatically answers some of those very complex questions. Social utility now has a definition. So you sh social utility is now defined in terms of stewardship and the ecosystem. It doesn't mean we can't use resources, but it means that we need to use them sustainably, right? Thoughtfully. It then means interference for that definition of nuisance, right? Interference, that again, fuzzy word that can include lots of things, becomes contextualized in stewardship. And we no longer have to worry about scale because the scale becomes rather obvious. The scale is an ecosystem. And each one can be evaluated differently and in terms of individual questions of sustainability. We don't have to worry about contrasting benefits at different scales and how those conflict with each other because nature handles its own multi-level interactions in terms of scale. If we act in ways that are thoughtfully conscious at one level, those effects uh, continue into the other levels in ways that are long-term manageable. So this means then if you think about a place like Florida's nature coast, where you can drive uh, 10 miles and be in really a completely different ecosystem. You can go from mud flats to sandy beaches uh, to what looks really like an Everglades swamp, all within just a few miles of each other. Uh, when we even try and conceptualize this as local social benefits, it's hard to know what those are. They're so easily malleable. But if we think in terms of ecosystems, we're able to evaluate that on a scale that works. So I, I like this picture because I took it when I was visiting my uh, niece at Christmas time. And um, I, I did a, what I would say is, I guess, a, a very non-contemporary thing, which is that I moved my car out of the center of that water before I took the picture. Uh, I think most people might have taken the picture, then moved the car, but my car got a little unintentional bath. And uh, the reason for that is because uh, no one was actually expecting this level of flooding. Why? That level of flooding uh, in that particular area, this is on that nature coast, usually comes with hurricanes in the summertime. Nobody was expecting it at December, and so nobody thought to say people should move their cars, right? But this came with what was essentially an average thunderstorm, except that it turned into flooding, uh, and where I was standing taking that picture is on the house. Right? I was standing on the front steps of the house, so the water is not far at all. And the building that you can see there, the tall one with the Christmas lights, uh, is actually the University of Florida's biological research station, and their lower level uh, is flooded there. So 
let's go back to, very briefly, why do I care about nuisance? Because as a litigator and a historian, what I see is the flexing of interpretations constantly to meet the next political need. It's a story of wars and corporations, and just occasionally, the pushback of American people. The problem is our engagement is very limited. We don't do that very often, uh, and arguably we've had no really major environmental statutes since the 1970s. Minor modifications in the 1990s and virtually nothing since then, right? Despite how very much science and the world have changed since then, right? It takes a lot to create citizen engagement, and that's normal for us. We don't change our laws every day, and there's something that's good about that. It creates political stability. But my concern then is those empty wins. At the moments when we are able to rise up and have the amount of investment, political enthusiasm, and human capital that actually gets us real legal change, I don't want to waste it. I want to have legal changes that are not so easily malleable with every political wind. And the only way that I can think of then to do that is to reimagine property uh, in a way so that it's not that pushback of owner versus everyone else. And it's instead an idea based on the land itself and based on stewardship. So Bruce Ackerman uh, has this theory of constitutional law and he says that we all have these revolutions and revolutions are the moments when law is really, really changed, right? So the Civil War was a revolution. Uh, the American Revolution obviously was a constitutional revolution. Uh, he says the Civil Rights era was a revolution. Um, and so we sort of have these about every you know, 50, 60 years, we tend to have them. And otherwise we do what uh, he calls everyday politics, which is most of the time we watch football, worry about where to get the best pastrami sandwich, uh, think about what we're going to have for breakfast tomorrow morning, all those kinds of everyday things, right? We don't want to get up every morning and have an obligation that I need to every morning worry about what people in the EPA are doing today, right? Because citizens can't do that. We can't on a sustainable long-term level because if we do, we're not doing our own jobs and taking care of our own families and all those kinds of things. In other words, we have a limited amount of social capital to create those revolutions. The really interesting thing is that based on Bruce Ackerman's model, which has been very predictive for constitutional, meaning real governmental change in America, we're due. We're due for a revolution. And there are social factors that suggest one is coming under his theory. What I would like to say is that with this revolution, I feel like it might be about climate change, that that may be the provoking thing. And if we do have that revolution, I desperately want us not to waste it. I want us to be able to actually use what I think may be our most precious resource for sustainability. How we get there uh, is social momentum. That's the most precious resource that we actually have in this fight. And I want to use it very thoughtfully. And I think that how we get there has to be about changing how we actually imagine property. How do we imagine places like Appalachia? Because if you think about Appalachia the way that you think about an ugly bug, you don't want to save Appalachia. You're just not motivated, right? But if you imagine Appalachia as a beautiful place, as beautiful mountains that I think of when I think of where I grew up, then I want very much to save it. And I think that those are the things, that's the emotion of property that actually drives us and creates that social revolution. So as much as there are some things that worry me in politics at the time, what I would like to do is to hope that uh, our future is in that revolution and in making a, uh, a better picture that will be actually enduring. Thank you all. Thank you.